Maybe we could just, um, let's just stand for a minute and, uh, and look at the word of God together and read it out loud and then let's just pray, okay? This is, this is the text verse I'm using. It's from Deuteronomy 15, verse 11 in the Amplified Version. Can you read it with me? For the poor will never cease out of the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hands to your brother, to your needy, and to your poor in your land. So Lord, we ask you to just do a miracle in us today that's happened over and over again. When we study the word of God, we change because it's truth and the truth changes us. It's, it's food for our system. It's the bread of life. You are the water that we need, that everlasting life that comes when we drink from you. And when we consume what you provide us, Lord, it gives us direction in this world. And Help us understand why it's so valuable to you that when we've been blessed, we don't hoard it to ourselves, but that we pay it forward. And as we pay forward the blessing you give us, you bless us in return. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So a lot of you might have seen that movie, Pay It Forward. Um, that's a great expression, in my opinion, that, uh, that sums up what much of what Jesus wants us to do, but maybe isn't, isn't always so clear to us why we should do it. Because what happens if, if you work in a very secular environment and people tend to be rude, short-tempered, that's Wall Street at least, uh, then you, you have to gain your status by how well you do. And they only, they only give you any value if you're, in my case, a big producer, if you make a lot of sales or, or whatever. And that's not how Jesus works, okay? Everybody's equal in his eyes. We don't judge people. We don't rate them. We don't say, well, I'll treat you one way, but you over here, no, you don't deserve to be treated the same way because I'm better than you. We may not think that, but that's how it comes across a lot of times. And this is something that Jesus was really good at helping people understand. And this is just a quick one that I'm sure you all know, but in Luke chapter 10, it says a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? Now, I find that interesting because this happens often when people ask Jesus a question. He responds with a question. <laughs> you ever notice that? It's not a bad idea. It's not a bad thing to do. Because it, it helps you clarify what they're thinking and, what, and where, they're, where they are, right? So he says, well, what's written in the law? It's another question. And that man answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. That's from Deuteronomy 6, 5. And then the next part, he said, your neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's from Leviticus 19, 18. How many think that was a pretty good answer? For this man, he knew the Bible pretty good. How many of you think that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Amen. You're so smart. You're just so smart. Not one person raised your hand. That's New Jersey, I'm telling you. We're just, we're just waiting, for, waiting for that slam. Because really, if it's all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all, all your soul, like, I can remember even just as a worship leader, when that song came out, Breathe, many years ago, I'm desperate for you. And I was getting convicted while I was singing it. Like, is this even true about me? And I'm singing the song. Like, really? Like, am I desperate for you? Should I not sing this song? Or should I just become more desperate for you? Like, are you really the air I breathe? Really? Are you really my daily bread? And, you know, that song just got on my case. <laughs> it's through the Holy Ghost, right? And I'm going to say, I love the Lord, my God, with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then I find myself doubting him or, or getting all upset about something else. And I, I realize maybe, maybe it's easy to say, but it's hard to do, isn't it? <laughs> and then Jesus does what he often does. He said to him, you've answered right. Do this and you will live. But the man, wanting to justify himself, said, who's my neighbor? And that's what a lot of us do. Who's my neighbor? Who am I supposed to love? Is it just the people on my job? I don't know if you ever noticed, but at the Christmas party, whenever the vice president or the, or the big wig comes in, everybody flocks to that person, and they want, they want to make a good impression. But if, if somebody who's the, uh, you know, answering the phones who doesn't look like they have the same status walks in, nobody's rushing over to them, right? And this is very secular. And um, we could say, I'm sure glad that's, that doesn't happen in the church, but it does. So even here, we have to be really careful, right, how we treat people. Who's my neighbor? And then instead of just giving him uh, 
And a quick answer, he tells a story that all of us know. It's, it's the story of the Good Samaritan. And you have to realize that the Jews and the Samaritans didn't like each other. Can you think of people today who don't like each other? Politics. Democrats like Republicans. Do Republicans like Democrats? Do you think less of that person because of a button that they're wearing? Mm, I'll let that one cook for a minute. So this man went from Jerusalem and thieves stripped him of his clothing. Now we have to assume if he was leaving from Jerusalem, he was a Jew, right? I don't think that's a leap. And they stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and left him for dead. Verse 31, a priest saw him and passed by on the other side. Now, maybe the guy was on his way to church. Maybe he had a really good reason not to stop. But one of my mentors uh, named John Wimber, I never met him, but I, I heard a lot about him, and I knew a lot of his friends. Uh, he gave a story one time. He said when he first got saved, he was going to Sunday school, and he loved the teacher. He'd get there early. He was waiting in the class, and, and one week, um, he, he's driving there, and he notices there's a car broke down on the side, but he didn't want to be late for the Sunday school class. So 20 minutes goes by. It's like 8.20 now, and the teacher walks in, and he's wiping off his hands of all the grease, and he said, I had to stop to help somebody out. <laughs> get the point? So, like, that, that said a real clear message that what's church, really? Like, we're here to learn, but the Lord prompted that man, even though he was teaching and he was going to be late, to help that person with the flat tire. See, and this is just being open to the Holy Spirit along the way while our day is unfolding. We're not going to always get it right, so don't beat yourself up, but just keep pressing in to be more like Jesus. The prize for the high calling that you've set for me, I press towards that mark for that prize. And then a Levite, similar to a priest, different duties in the church, also passes by. And it's interesting that it's on the other side, isn't it? Because like, I don't even want to be near you. Not only I can not stop and help you, I don't even want to be near you. And if somebody ever sees you and crosses the street to go to the other side, that's probably not a good sign, right? <laughs> and then verse 33 says, but a Samaritan, a certain Samaritan, that, that means something in this story. If you're the Republican, it's a certain Democrat. If you're the Democrat, it's a certain Republican, somebody who you don't like. And we could get much stronger words than that, couldn't we? But are they still a human being? Does God want anybody to perish? And are you being a good witness? And are you praying for those people? Boy, this is hard. I don't know about church. <laughs> 36, we know what happens. The Samaritan stops. He helps the man. He takes him to an inn. He pays the bill. He tells the owner of the inn, even if he runs up a bigger bill, I'll pay you when I come back. And Jesus says, so which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Now, what does this have to do with the food drive that I mentioned? It's, it's partly this, this barrier that I think we can have sometimes about helping the poor or doing physical work. It's like maybe we've been taught that whole argument about faith and works and we can't earn our salvation with God. And just be careful, right? Because, yes, make a donation. That's awesome. We need money to build the barn. We need money to make that the store that we want it to be. But there's also something about engaging our physical body and being there and looking at people and speaking to people or, or handing them food and, and showing the kindness of God, that's, king, that's a kingdom transaction, right? It's not just a works mentality. It's taking the thing that happened to us here today in this wonderful experience that we had of sensing the Lord's presence and bringing it outside to people who don't know that feeling. And it's let your kingdom come, let your will be done in my life today, Lord. Not that I hide in my room and don't have interaction with anybody, but that I come out and I shine my light. And this is a real practical way. Because the people that receive help like that are used to being shamed. And that's a shame, isn't it? They're used to people looking at them like, oh my God, loser. You can't get a job. There's so many jobs available. Why aren't you working? Why do you need to get a handout? Now, they might not say that but they act that way. Not, not so here. That's not God's kingdom coming and his will being dunning. <laughs> if I'm going to make it rhyme. So that's what I just asked myself. Everyone's your neighbor, right? Like, who's my neighbor? Well, the, Jesus is basically saying, sorry, you're not going to like this answer, but everyone's your neighbor. And, and you might have to, you know, obviously you're going to have to draw some barriers. You're not going to allow yourself to be abused or, or people to mistreat you. But we're a whole long way, you know, corporately 
from that than we are of just being kind to people, just looking at them, just listening and asking the Lord to give you the download that you need. And I love this language in, in the voice translation in Ephesians 2. You were strangers separated from God's people. Anybody but me besides uh, were in that place where you were a stranger from God? I mean, I heard a testimony this week from a guy that just blew me away how he described what it was like to be lost and, and in that dark place of not knowing God. And he's been saved four years, which is not really that long of a time. But, but the change in him and, and the way his life has changed and his marriage has changed and, and how he's choosing to live his life has completely shifted. Anybody else? Didn't that happen? When you started reading the Bible and the Holy Spirit came in and, and you, you recognized his presence, it's like you became a different person. Same body, different spirit on the inside. I was a stranger separated from God's people. I was an alien to the covenant that they had with God. I was hopelessly stranded without God in a fractured world. And if all you do is sign up to go to ShopRite on Thanksgiving, as you're interacting with those people, you're, you're asking the Lord and you're praying and you're saying, can I give them an encouraging word? And in my lifetime, there's never been a time when people are this broken that they are right now. And it doesn't take much to talk to them. Just scratch a little bit and boom, that pain is pouring out about COVID, about the restrictions, about losing jobs, about losing loved ones, about no closure because I didn't get to go to the funeral for somebody that I really loved. And some doctor made a decision to pull the plug on one of my relatives and he didn't have the right to do that. And, and they're still harboring that stuff. But life still keeps going on anyway, doesn't it? Like you run out of money before you run out of month. <laughs> Bummer. And you start waiting on that check to come in and like you're eating macaroni and cheese. And it's not even your fault. Like one of our people here got a letter that if he's not vaccinated at his job, he's going to have to pay a higher insurance bill than everybody else. I'm telling you, don't get me started on that hopelessly stranded without God in a fractured world. That describes me to a T before I knew the Lord. But now, because of Jesus, the anointed, and his sacrifice, all that has changed. To the degree that I'm willing to engage with it, all that has changed. If I don't want to engage with it, then he's not forcing himself on me. But to the degree I want to, it's changed. God gathered me together. I was so far away, and I brought, he brought me near to the Father. By the royal blood of the anointed, our liberating king. Like, this is good language. I'll, I'll encourage you on The Voice. It's free. You can go on Bible Gateway online. You can get it for free, along with, I don't know, 40 other translations. Great tool. So it's kind of where I want to go today. I'm going to shorten it a little because we ran long. But before we receive the gift of God's grace, this is the commentary that was in the uh, Voice version. But before we receive the gift of God's grace, we are homeless orphans searching for some place to belong. Now, if, if I had to summarize one word of what the last 20 months have been about, other than the sickness and, and the COVID piece, it's identity. Right? That's been the main topic, is how do we define our identity? That's never been confusing for Christians. We've always identified first as sons and daughters of the living God. That's your title, right? But whether you were a boy or a girl never came up when I was in school, right? I mean, that was pretty obvious. Uh, football team... We knew those were boys, right? Like other sports, we knew that they were girls, right? That was, there was nothing confusing about that. Now, here's the tricky part about being a Christian. There are people who are confused about that. And are we not supposed to talk to them or castigate them or shame them? No. We're supposed to know them and love them and meet them and get, build a relationship with them. Introduce them to a living God. Then it's out of your hands because once they know him, he'll straighten it out. However, that's going to happen, but, but sometimes we put a wall up with people. And when Mario Murillo was here, that's his gift, is evangelism. He has a love for the lost. And he's being invited to a lot of big, important places that he's not going because he said, I want to be in the tent. Right At this place in his life, he could pretty much take an invitation wherever he wants to go. He's like, no, my heart is to be in the tent. Seeing drug addicts get set free, emptying out wheelchairs, because that's what I was born to do. And all these years, that's what he's going to still keep doing, even though he has other options, because he knows his identity. That's the point. Do we? 
I was a homeless orphan before the gift of God's grace, and I was searching for some place to belong. Now, you wouldn't have thought I was a homeless orphan because I had a house to live in, and, but I was identifying in completely the wrong way in a very sinful lifestyle. I'm sure some of you too, right? But now all that has changed. The Father, notice, Father, not omnipotent God. Father, family, man. Father means man. Reaches out through his son, family. Get it? It's not just this disconnected piece. It's a family. Reaches out to his son and all those orphaned by sin and death. See, that's poverty. People that have been off, or, excuse me, orphaned by sin and death, those are poor in spirit. It's not just poor for money. It's not just needed to come and get food once a month because you don't have enough to have food in your house. It can take so many different ways. Uh, what? Postures. You could be poor in spirit and have all the money in the world. But you're not at peace. You're not sleeping at night. You have a, a child that you don't know where they are. They're prodigal child. You are addicted to some drug or some whatever, substance abuse. But that's poor, see? It doesn't just have to be money poor. It's broken in spirit. Or those, you know, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. First one of the Beatitudes. They're blessed because they have access to the kingdom of God through you and me. Supernaturally, sure. But what about us? Are we those ambassadors? And it's really good to think about this now because it's Thanksgiving season and people do have a heart to give. We know that we've been blessed so that we can be a blessing. Uh, but I just want to drive home something that the Lord made real to me this week. He brings us into his family. And, you know, family is just one of those other things that's completely under attack today. And if anybody should be standing strong, it's Christians. It's all through the Bible. That's who he made us. He calls himself Father and gives us his spirit to be that family together, right here, together as a church. Don't forsake this assembling together. We're adopted into his forever family and then fully enfranchised. I like that word, enfranchised, as his heirs. That means that's your first identity. Now, did everybody get a hand down on the way in? All right, so this is like what I would call the great exchange. God pays you back. I'm sorry, God pays your enemies back. You pay forward his blessings. All right? So it's really all based on, on a few verses in one chapter in Isaiah 61. Um, so I'm not going to go through that right now, but hold on to it because I want you to think of that girl in that picture, okay? This girl has just been really hitting me hard, right? Because... That is some picture. I, I have a hard time believing that an artist just made that up. Like, I think he saw a real girl. I don't know how old she is, maybe 13. And I think it's her little brother that she's holding. And there's something so real about that picture, the way they're, the way they're laying there, the exhaustion that you see in the picture that, you know, she's just trying to protect him. And she's completely vulnerable, just out on the street with a little plastic thing begging people for money and, and, and a little jug of water nearby. And... I just want to say for me, that was me. Not homeless, but spiritually that was my picture. I was an orphan. I didn't know what to do. I was chasing the wrong compass. It was going to get me killed. And thankfully, somebody loved me enough to keep talking to me, even though I rejected them and kept pressing in until I was so broken that I was ready to turn to it because nothing else was working. Now, I don't recommend that. I don't recommend waiting until you're so broken that nothing else is working. Just understand that you were born first as a child of God, and he wants to live inside of you. That's the big difference between the Old and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, they would have to go to the temple to experience the presence of God. In the New Testament, right, we know this, death, burial, resurrection, and then the release of Holy Spirit. So your body now is the temple, so he lives inside of you. And if I look at that girl and I say to her, do you know that God loves you so much that he wants to live inside of you? That's very different than if you die tonight, what is your eternal reward going to be? You're going to go to hell because you don't know Jesus. And that may be true, but she's not ready to hear that, is she? You don't need to shame people. They already know they're in a mess. But what about this loving God wants to live inside of you, wants you to be the holy of holies, where his presence dwells. 
So he goes into the synagogue. He stands up to read. You know this probably from Luke chapter 4, verse 17. He's handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. That's what we would call chapter 61 now. And when he had opened up the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Anybody here can say that? Spirit of the Lord is upon you? Okay, that's good because you're, you're a sibling to Jesus. Because he has anointed you and Jesus to preach the gospel to the poor. Not just financially poor. Spiritually broken people, and there's plenty of them around. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Anybody have a broken heart in your life at some time? You were broken up with and you didn't do the breaking up in the relationship? You were the brokey? They don't want to date you anymore. And it's like, well, I didn't stop loving the person just because they stopped loving me. What do I do with that? Go listen to country music and want to kill yourself is what you do. <laughs> I mean, every song is about the broken heart, isn't it? It's like, how many ways can you say that story? <laughs> Sells a lot of beer, though, I bet you. Well, isn't that what people do? They just want to medicate their pain, so you're just going to run and hide from that. There's such a better life than that, isn't there? He's saying, I'm going to proclaim liberty to captives. Is that your title? Yes. We have the same spirit. Proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty. That's the same word they use in the Old Testament for jubilee. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That was a jubilee year when all debts were forgiven. And when you come to Jesus, some people are at the altar here today. This is your year of the favor of the Lord and the jubilee. Your debts have been forgiven, not because you earned it, but because he loves you. But you have to love him back. You've got to make room in your heart for him. Don't expect him to force his way on you. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. How many believe that right now? Right now, this is the year of the Lord's favor. Because God is not bound by time. He's not bound by physical location. But he lives inside of you. So if you have this liberating king, which is the name that... The voice version uses for Jesus, so I put it up there. Jesus, the liberating king. He lives inside of you. And then you already have all these verses for time's sake. You can read down that list in Isaiah 61 that I gave you on that handout, right? That it goes to, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, all that. But how about beauty for ashes? How about oil of joy for mourning? How about garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness? Man, if you're going to memorize something, memorize this. Because this is the great exchange. He doesn't want us to take vengeance. He said, I will pay back your enemies. Don't return fire for fire, because then both of you are burned. They might fire at you, but you don't have to fire back, because the battle belongs to the Lord, not your Italian temper. <laughs> so now I'm going to give you this asylum seeker piece, okay? And Again, I was, even though I was a U.S. citizen, my grandfather came here from Italy, he got citizenship, so I'm, you know, whatever that is, second generation American. But that's not what he's talking about. We're not talking about the border debates and all, we're just talking about whose citizenship do we carry. And I was carrying the citizenship of death. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, the wages of sin is no doubt about it, really, no doubt about it. And... I got transferred out of that kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of the son of his love, is the way the Bible says it. And so have you, even if you never took drugs, even if you weren't doing openly stupid things like I was, even if you were a great person, you weren't great enough. You still had original sin in your life and you needed to be saved. Does anybody want to argue with me? We could talk after service. But you weren't a citizen of God's kingdom because you didn't ask him in and you need a new passport. So this says the ultimate sign, if you aren't a literal asylum seeker, is to receive citizenship in the country that they've adopted as their own. That's the position that Paul declares for those that were unsaved. The Gentiles, Christians find themselves, and Paul's talking to them, they were once foreigners and strangers in relation to Israel, but now they are full members. Purely on what Jesus accomplished through his death, burial, resurrection, and the subsequent release of Holy Spirit. I know I'm going fast. Don't just think it's the cross, okay? I'm not trying to be you know, anti-Christian here in any way. I know we focus on the cross. There's a huge one right on the back wall there, and we need to be reminded of that sacrifice. Pick up your cross daily. But without the resurrection, the cross is neutralized. So because of the resurrection, we then receive Holy Spirit. 
It's good for you that I leave, Jesus said, because then Father can send the comforter to you. But are you welcoming him in your life? Are you asking him to be more of a part of your life in your daily decision? You can build a relationship with Holy Spirit. And it's, don't, I don't know, this gets a little complicated, but try not to, to embody him and think he's like another person. He's everywhere, right? He's the spirit of the eternal God that was hovering in Genesis, hovering over the whole earth. And now he has camped in your life. That's the mercy seat. It's right inside of you. So instead of speaking to him like a person, relate to him as this amazing power that, that is released by God into our lives. And, and it's humbling, isn't it? Why would God do that? We're so imperfect. There's so many flaws. Yet, because of the position that we're in right now, waiting for his final return, this is the peace we get, like the down payment, the Bible says. You've got the Spirit of God residing in you as, as a piece of the future that when you'll have a whole, no down payment, you own the whole thing. Right? Now, that's, that's exciting to be. So the early Christians knew that the church was not a building. The believers themselves were the place where God was now deciding to live. And this just got me. God himself has, in a sense, become a stranger and an asylum seeker within his own world. I don't know if you're getting it, but I, it hit me like a bomb went off. So those people that come up here today to receive the Lord as their Lord and Savior, it's like God was saying, oh, thank you for letting me come in and live in your life because I need a place to live. And I want to live in your heart. And you just gave me the right to be a citizen in your life, and now you could be a citizen in my kingdom. So it takes a lot of the weight off of witnessing to somebody. God loves you so much, he wants to camp out. He wants a tabernacle right inside of you. Not the threat of going to hell. Now look, there might be times you have to tell somebody about the reality of hell, and there's a choice here. But it really would help if you knew them already. And they know your heart, and they know it's because you love them, and you're not shaming them and hating them, right? So this says God himself has, in a sense, become a stranger and an asylum seeker within his world. He's having me walk past this girl on the street like there's these steps that she's laying on there with her brother, I think it is, and just lay down and, and say, can I pray for you? And are you willing to, to believe the impossible fact that God loves you so much that he wants to camp out inside your heart? He wants to live inside you. He's desperate to live inside you, but he's asking me to be the go-between here. I never looked at it that way. It's intimidating to witness the people for a lot of us. Am I the only one? Well, raise your hand. Be honest. Okay. Like, not a lot of us were naturally built to be evangelists, right? But boy, when we have one here like we had and we get activated, that's a big bump in our ability because we got activated in it. All right, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here because of the time, and I'm really just going to cut to the last couple of verses. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. <laughs> Maybe we will go back one more because he said, oh. <laughs> the Messiah has come to preach this sweet message of peace to you. You know that because if you're that asylum seeker, you left your home, you just got the clothes on your back, you have nothing, the money was taken out of your bank, and now all of a sudden you're a citizen in a new place and there's no war going on, you finally have a sense of peace that I can exhale. I'm not on the run anymore. A message of peace to you, right? That's what Jesus came. The ones who were distant and to those who are near. And now because we're united to him, we're family with Christ, we both have equal and direct access to the realm of the Holy Spirit to come before the Father. So you're not foreigners or guests, but rather you're children of the city of the Holy Ones with all the rights of family members of the household of God. Somebody better be happy. Yeah, don't be afraid to show it. We come together every Sunday and we celebrate the goodness of God. You might not like the flags and the music's too loud and it goes on too long, but look, really, like, there's no other time during the week that I'm singing with anybody. And the ones who are singing at me are singing the blues. So it's a very uplifting thing to be singing together with everybody. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you've been so good. Your goodness is running after me. I need that word picture, man. I need to be reminded of that. 
And the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love. He doesn't care. He comes after me in the worst pit that he could find me. And now I'm a member of his family. You are rising together, right? We are rising like the perfectly fitted stones of the old temple, but now we're the new living temple. All of us together here are different stones in this beautiful, alive building. And that's why we need each other to flourish. We don't want people in our church that are part of our church family to be operating at a four when God wants them to be operating at a ten. Right? So it's our job to encourage one another to say what we feel the Lord is saying over them, especially the, the people in authority with leadership. That's our job is to speak over you what the Lord is saying. But with one another, we encourage and uplift one another and we say, hey, I was praying and the Lord put you on my heart. Does this mean anything to you? And boy, I'll tell you what, more often than not, it sure does. So we're rising like these perfectly fitted stones of the temple upon the foundation laid by the apostles and the prophets. I'll unpack that another day. And we're all connected to the head cornerstone of the building, the anointed one, Jesus Christ himself. And that entire building is under construction. That's what Joe said. Transformed. We're being transformed into this image. We're all under construction. And you never finish the job. Because none of us will be hanging on a cross and saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We'd be saying, call down fire from heaven. Nuke them. Yeah, that's our human nature. Vengeance is mine, says Peter. <laughs> We're continually growing under his supervision until it rises up, completed as the holy temple of the Lord himself. I'm in the Passion Translation now. Strap on your seatbelt. <laughs> this means that God is transforming each one of you into the holy of holies. So look at somebody. Can you just look at somebody and say, you are are being transformed into the holy of holies. Believe it. Believe it. It's the word of God. But I don't feel too holy. Go by your feelings. You just keep confessing what God says about you, not what the devil says about you. When she was able to wave that flag today, she took back what the devil had stolen from her because she can worship with that arm again. <laughs> transforming me into the holy of holies you better do a detox on my chemistry and my body because I put some weird stuff in there it's a miracle it's a miracle he's still willing to be living inside of this unholy body and yet it's like give me more room give me more room make space for me get rid of that old stuff give me more room in your heart you'll watch what I do I can transform this place you're a hoarder of the wrong stuff. <laughs> Let's stand. I'll stop the analogies before somebody else needs to get saved again. I mean, if you're worried about opening up a closet door in your house because you're afraid of what's going to fall on you, that might be a sign, right? That might be a sign that it's time for a detox. <laughs> You're in a detox house right here, I can tell you. So nobody here is going to pull rank and say, well, you know, you should be healed by now. We've been praying for two weeks. Like, what's your problem? <laughs> no, you're a lifetime member. You can come for prayer as often as you want. Now, you should be responsive to what we're asking you to do, right? You still have to own your part of it. But with God, nothing is impossible. Nothing. Right? So can we just lift our hands to the Lord and say, thank you, Lord, that you want to live inside my heart, that my body is your temple, and you're transforming me into the holy of holies. That's worth meditating on that one. So you don't have to repeat this part, but just think about it. as you walk around in your daily life and you're interacting with people, that, that holy of holies is, is fired up on the inside of you. And God is saying, I want to live inside her heart too. I want you to talk to her so she knows that I want to live inside her heart too. I'm tired of being an asylum seeker. I'm tired of looking for hearts to live in. He doesn't just do it supernaturally. 
He chooses to engage with us and allow us to have this right as an ambassador. And I don't know about you, but I have found the longer I've been saved, the bar keeps moving a little higher. He's expecting more of me as a mature Christian than he was when I was a brand new Christian. Amen. I'll just leave that one there. No shame, but it seems to be to be a reality that we want to get on the meat and get off the milk, right, if we've been saved a long time. So you can raise them up one more time. Lord, I bless your people. I thank you for those that came to the altar. And there might be somebody here who didn't come to the altar. The altar's open. There's a prayer ministry team here right now. If what you heard sparked something on the inside of you, please come down and talk to us. We'll give you a Bible. We'll speak to you the, the, the language of the kingdom of God and how it's so far superior to what the world is asking you to feed on. The altars are open, so come down if that's you. But those of you that are leaving now, I want to commission you to be those people as ambassadors of, of God and say next week when we come together, God's not an asylum seeker anymore. I led somebody to the Lord and somebody knows that, that he's living in their heart right now. That's the greatest thing that can happen, isn't it? Thank you, Lord, that you give us this right to co-labor with you. And I just pray as your people go that they will feel that anointing on their lives to be able to lead others to the Lord. That, that release that was given last week when Mario was here, Lord, let it be sparked on the inside of us to be about our Father's business throughout the course of this week. I bless them as they go now in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Give a shout.